All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, uh, Chen Zhu, uh, Zhu Wuchen. Uh, I'm a, a professor of finance at the University of Hong Kong. So welcome to uh, uh, this uh, edition of the uh, Quantitative History Webinar Series. Uh, so today we are really uh, honored to have uh, Professor Harris uh, to share his uh, work, uh, in particular his recent work, uh, on, on uh, the history of business organizations. Uh, in particular, uh, as I mentioned, uh, his book uh, called Going the Distance, uh, Eurasian Trade and the Rise of the Business Corporation. So Professor Harris' work uh, has focused on the history of the business corporation. He studies the business corporation in Britain and comparatively and also in the wider context of legal and economic history, the history of industrialization, the history of capitalism, as well as the history of colonialism and globalization. He has published uh, three books. Uh, in addition to Going the Distance, uh, the two other books are Industrializing English Law, Entrepreneurship, and business organization, 1720 to 1844. The third book is uh, Israeli Law, the, form uh, the Formative Years, 1948 through 1977. Uh, without further ado, let me uh, uh, turn uh, uh, the floor to uh, Professor Harris. So you will have one hour uh, to present and then uh, to be followed uh, with uh, Q&A from uh, our commentators, uh, as well as uh, from the audience. Okay, so Professor Harris, here you go. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Professor Chen. I would like to thank you for the invitation to present in your economic history uh, group's quantitative history webinar series. It's a real pleasure to do this. I would like also to thank Beth for organizing all of the details of this event. Uh, this is a, a unique opportunity for me to present this book, as you mentioned, the book uh, that was published just before the pandemic in February, a couple of weeks before the beginning of the pandemic by Princeton University Press in the Economic History Series, uh, the Princeton Economic History Series edited by Joel Mukir. So I take the, the coming hour in order to present some of the highlights of the book and as I think you'll see, uh, it will be mostly uh, the second uh, part, the second half of the book that I'll be presenting. Uh, the business corporation is highly dominant in today's economy. And, and a key question, a key puzzle I was addressing in the book is what made it so uh, dominant in the global economy and uh, I started dealing with the question after dealing with later periods in other projects, as mentioned by Professor Chen, I started dealing with uh, what I view as the formative period in the history of the Joint Stock Business Corporation, which is the, uh, the few decades after 1600, or maybe the century, the 17th century, going from 1600 to the late, to around 1700. I'm, I was trying to better understand the circumstances under which the business corporation was formed. Just to give you a full span of history, there were corporations before, we'll talk about them, uh, the expansion, the global expansion of the corporation took place only in the 19th century. And I will try to explain how come the corporation was so uniquely Western European or European for about uh, uh, 300 years before 250 years before it expanded globally more widely. Uh, my research questions are two. One of them is what is the role of organizations or what's the role of organizational forms, and particularly one type of organizational form, the, the Joint Stock Business Corporation in long distance Eurasian trade. The second question is what's the role of long distance trade and particularly Eurasian trade in the history and in the evolution of the business corporation. So I took the period in order to understand both what's going on on the trade side and what's going on on the organizational front. And I have two main arguments in the book. 
I'll present them here briefly and then I'll try to establish them in, in the coming hour. So the first one is uh, that around 1600, one could uh, 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 identify what I term as organizational revolution. An organizational revolution that uh, uh, manifested itself in the first appearance of the Joint Stock Business Corporation. But for me, it's not only a, one additional type of organization that was formed around 1600. Uh, there is a large menu of organizational forms. Each of them was developed in a different stages in history in different regions of Eurasia. What's unique about this organizational type is that it is, in my view, the first time in which an organizational form allowed impersonal cooperation, impersonal collaboration. That is collaboration between outside investors, passive investors that did not personally know the insiders, the managers, the executives, the entrepreneurs, and those insiders. So this was the first impersonal, large scale impersonal uh, cooperation that became possible thanks to this new organizational form, the Joint Stock Business Corporation. There is never a first time in history, there are always some earlier uh, manifestations of the same idea, but this is a larger scale in my view than was ever seen of impersonal collaboration. And to be more precise, impersonal collaboration that is not based either on state coercion, ruler coercion, emperor coercion, coercion on the one side, or on religious coercion on the other side. It was a voluntary cooperation. That's the uniqueness of this. So this, a, a unique a, a moment in history, this organizational revolution is pivotal for understanding the later history of the business corporation. Many of the features of the modern business corporation were shaped in this period of time in the 17th century in the context of long distance Eurasian trade. And, and, and the later history of the business corporation uh, by the late 17th century, we have the Bank of England as a business corporation. In the 18th century, we have canal corporations in England. We have insurance and other financial corporations in the late 18th century. By the 19th century, we have railway corporations. We have industrial corporations, manufacturing corporations later in the, in the 19th century and into the 20th century. The history is much more familiar. So my argument that this formative period, the 17th century, is essential for understanding the later role of the business cooperation in economic development, maybe in the great divergence or whatever uh, it's called. The second main argument of the book is that this organizational revolution is crucial not only in the history of the business of, of business organization, but also in the history of global Eurasian global trade. The organizational revolution is a key for understanding uh, 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 the unfolding of global trade in the 17th century a period in which Western European economies became dominant in Eurasian and global trade. And my argument in this sense is that the Joint Stock Business Corporation allowed for uh, connections between these kind of, uh, the formation of the first real global system in which trade was going on from China all the way to Western Europe in one hall, rather than going from one regional system to the next regional system to the next regional system, as it shows here in the uh, 13th century, for example, one can see a, a, a new system, Eurasian system going around the Cape of Good Hope, as we'll be seeing. But it's more than just the European a, a, a dominance of Eurasian si system. The European came to dominate the global trade system by connecting the newly discovered Americas with Asia a, and a, and the Atlantic connection and the Pacific connection are also part of the story. I will not talk much about the Atlantic Pacific uh, 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 connections. They were mostly not conducted by joint stock corporations. They are beyond the, pro the scope of this project. Maybe in the Q&A Q I can say something about them. But basically, uh, my argument is that organizational uh, 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 explanations are crucial for understanding uh, 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 the rise of Europe to dominance in global trade, more so than other common explanations that can be found in the literature, like some superiority of the Europeans in ship building technology, in navigation, open sea or open ocean navigation, in weapons 
or the use of weapons upon, on, on, the, on ships or by the willingness of the Europeans to use force, uh, 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 trade, arm trade. So all of the three, these four explanations, I don't want to totally downplay them, but I think that they are not sufficient and the organizational revolution element adds a, a significant new dimension that has to be taken into account uh, when we're trying to explain Europe uh, rise to dominance for a while in this global Eurasian and global trade. So uh, the time frame of the book is uh, 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 covers three centuries. Uh, uh, the first century, let's say 1400, 1500 or so, was one in which Europeans were not present in the Indian Ocean. A few Europeans uh, uh, traveled overland to China, like Marco Polo, but there was no significant presence of European on the Silk Road and no European presence a, a, on the oceanic uh, trade. The next century, 1500 to 1600, is one in which the first Europeans arrive in the Indian Ocean. The first Europeans following Vasco da Gama are the Portuguese, but they operated without joint stock business corporations. Their uh, enterprise was mostly relying on the Portuguese king, on the ruler. And the th third century, which is the century I am driving the book to, the 17th century from 1600 to 1700 or so is the one in which the Dutch and the English appear in the Indian Ocean. They formulate a new organizational form, the Joint Stock Business Corporation, and they use it extensively in the Indian Ocean. So in order to understand the Dutch and the English, I believe that I had to go two centuries, at least two centuries back, maybe more than this in some parts of the book, in order to un better understand what the innovation was and what was the competition this innovation had to deal with in terms of other options, organizational options. Now, especially or, or in terms of regions, I'm covering comparatively all of Eurasia from China to India to the, Islam, to the Islamic Middle East uh, and to Southern and Western Europe. Uh, I definitely didn't devote the, the needed attention to Japan, a worldwide thing, but something I didn't do. I followed some ethnic groups as well, such as the Armenians, the Jews, some other ethnic groups. And I also covered a full range of organizational forms in order to understand the Joint Stock Business Corporation. I believe, and uh, I think that rightly so, that one has to start from the bottom, from the single peddler taking his uh, 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 goods on his back and walking or using some animal in order to cross uh, some terrain and building up from the peddler all the way through family firms and partnerships and networks up to the business corporation. So, so this is a, 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 the time span I'm covering. Asians were there all the way. The Portuguese were there also in the 17th century, but they lost ground. And the Dutch and the English are the, the key for understanding the joint stock business corporation of the 17th century. Uh, I realize that I have to understand both the overland routes, uh, usually called or, or commonly called the Silk Road, with its branches going south as well, and the, uh, the oceanic routes going all the way from the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, to the Bay of Bengal and the South China Sea. Uh, and later on also the Cape route. So, so I covered both overland and sea in order to better understand the overland alternatives to the uh, maritime activity of the, the East India companies. Uh, as I said, I covered the entire span of organizational forms from the peddler, the traveling agent, uh, to the corporation, the state or ruler owned enterprise. In terms of theory, and I'll be short on theory now, and maybe in the Q&A we'll get more to the theory, uh, I found the pre-existing uh, theoretical framework for studying trade insufficient for my purposes. Let's say the Smithian approach, the Marx approach, the Marxian approach, Fernand Brodel's Anal approach or Max Weber's approach. Most of them focused on the trade itself rather than on organizations. I th sense that in order to study organizations, I have to introduce some new uh, uh, just want to make sure.
I just realized that I, my screen was not shared in the transition to the Facebook platform. So now you can see the screen again. I apologize for this. Uh, so uh, the pre-existing uh, uh, theoretical frameworks focused on trade, on markets, on goods, rather than on organizational forms. Uh, the Weberian uh, uh, framework was somewhat useful for me in, in order to study organizational forms, but I found it insufficient. Uh, what I used in order to uh, uh, address my research questions, uh, I, I used what I'm usually using in my uh, scholarship, which is the new institutional economics a, a theoretical framework, organizational theory framework, my, uh, the kind of framework that introduced by Douglas North and some of the others, uh, 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 Ronald Coase uh, and Oliver Williamson and others, start, uh, as it was developed since the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, I also used uh, some of the scholarship I knew as a legal scholar some of the law and economics literature uh, uh, on business corporations, some of the legal history literature, and some of the literature in comparative law, which assisted me in studying uh, comparative institutions and in studying the migration and the transplant of uh, institutions. So, so this is the theory I used. Uh, uh, what I was doing is, in a way, uh, uh, using what I view as natural experiment, in the sense that at least four different regions in Eurasia, the, the Chinese region, the Indian subcontinent region, the Middle Eastern region, and the Western European region, they were all trying to do the same type of uh, business activity, long distance trade, in the same environment, Eurasia, overland Eurasia, and uh, and the Indian Ocean, they were dealing more or less with the same goods that I'll specify in a moment. So they were all trying to perform the same functions. And the question for me was whether when they're trying to perform the same functions, they use the same organizational solutions, the same organizational forms or different organizational forms. So in this sense, uh, I'm looking for regions that were trying to achieve the same goals, the same business goals, for profit, uh, 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 and in some cases, not all of the regions were interested in the same thing in the same period, but I focused on those periods and those regions that were part of this story, were part of this uh, 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 natural experiment. And now I was trying to understand when different regions developed or adapted similar organizational forms and they were and when they were ending up with different organizational forms and when i saw similarities i was trying to understand whether the similarities resulted from parallel solutions to the same functional problem that led to similar solutions similar organizational solutions or was it a copying by one region of a solution that was already developed in another area. When they there was a divergence, when there were different solutions, I was trying to understand whether the different solutions resulted from the fact that one region did not know about the solution adopted in another region, or whether that region were, was aware of the solution adopted in the other region, but nevertheless, for some, one reason or another, didn't want or could not adopt the same solution. So these are the uh, three tribes that I'm referring to here. Uh, uh, in terms of methodology, I was also using what I term micro studies, rather than talking about abstract organizational forms, I was trying to delve down into concrete examples. Uh, and I selected examples, first of all, by their relevance to Eurasian trade. And secondly, and that's a very important criteria or filter, the preservance of uh, 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 records of uh, suitable records for un ident understanding the organizational details because it's often the case that records were not preserved about the organizational details. More records were preserved about the trade activity, the goods, the tariff paid, uh, the tariffs that were paid than about the exact details of the contracts that often did not survive 
or the exact details of other organizational forms that were not always recorded in writing, and even if they were, did not survive all the way to the 21st century. So for me, theory, when I am using the new institutional economics theory, the organizational theory, and some of the legal theories, I'm not using them in order to uh, formulate predictive models. I'm using them because of the scarcity of sources and the idiosyncrasy of some of the cases. There was only one English East Indian company, only one Dutch East Indian company. So I, cannot, I could not formulate uh, uh, models and try to see how do they behave in the real historical world. I used theory in all, mostly as interpretive tool. I used it in the, in the way in which Avner Greif, my friend, used it and some others. You have scarcity of uh, uh, records, scarcity of resources. You have some of the observations and you are trying to make sense of the observations through the use of uh, theory uh, in these micro studies. And I used comparative analysis quite a lot in the manner that I just mentioned to see whether solutions were similar or different and why were they similar or why were they different. So uh, today, the time I'm left with today, some 40 minutes, I'll be talking mostly about the second half of the book, uh, 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 more briefly about the third part of the book, which is the long trade enterprises on the eve of the organizational revolution. Uh, and I devote more time to the actual transformation uh, of the joint stock business corporation, which is the fourth part. Uh, the first two parts of the book, if you are interested in reading them, they, deal, they provide a a, a comparative survey of organizational uh, forms throughout Euro-Asia, starting with the small building blocks, as like the peddler, the partnership, the loan, and building up to more complicated forms like the network, the, the merchant network, and the larger uh, uh, family firm. So the, the first part deals with this survey. It also is the dealing with the issue of migration, tries to develop theory of migration of institutions, resistance to migration of institutions, and, and it's, it's offering, I think, the first of its kind a, a, a account of migration of organizational forms throughout Eurasia. These are the first part, part one and part two of the book. And they have to start in, in antiquity, in the ancient uh, Mediterranean mostly, because of uh, the availability of sources kind of in Phoenician, Athenian, Greek, Roman times, trying to figure out what were the basic uh, building blocks that were formulated in antiquity? How did they uh, 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 evolve from antiquity into the Middle Ages and into the early modern period? And how were they used in the trade of the early modern period? As I said, they followed the migration of some organizational forms. For example, the commanda, uh, called the Kirad in Islamic literature or Budaba in Islamic literature, how did it migrate and some other forms of organization. And now uh, I'm getting into the background of the fourth phase, the fourth part of the book. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what's the environment, what's at stake? Why are we uh, dealing with long distance trade? Why is long distance trade the key for understanding organizational challenges and the organizational revolution. Uh, once the Europeans, and now I'm telling the story mostly from the perspective of the Europeans, but not only so, uh, for the Europeans to travel in the Mediterranean or to travel in, uh, along the Atlantic coast of Western Europe involved re relatively short distance uh, 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 of trade. 1,400 nautical miles, 1,200 nautical miles, miles. this kind of 1,500, not more than 1,500 nautical miles. Once, eh, 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 but for the Chinese to go to the Persian Gulf or the Red Sea or the Arabian Sea, or for the Persians or the Arabs to go to China involved much longer voyages, eh, 5,400 miles from Fuzhou to eh, eh, uh, Aden, 6,300 miles, going from Nanjing to Basra. Uh, so, the, so, so to start with, the ones that were involved in longer trade were the Chinese and the Arabs more than the Europeans. Things have changed for the Europeans only once Columbus have discovered, so to speak, the Americas, Lisbon, uh, Cadiz to Havana involved 
almost 4,000 4, mile, nautical miles of voyage, much longer than anything they, the Europeans experienced before, but less than what the Chinese or the Persians experienced before. The real leap forward for the Europeans was once Vasco da Gama discovered the Cape route, the, the route around the Cape into the Indian Ocean. Here, the Europeans suddenly jumped from 1,500 to 1,900 10,000, uh, 12,000 uh, nautical miles of voyages. And this was a game changer uh, for the Europeans. They had to go through uh, voyages that were six times and more longer than what they've experienced before that. They had to address these challenges in a manner that they did not have to address uh, as long as they were involved in short distance trade within the Mediterranean or let's say from uh, uh, the Netherlands to the Baltics or things like this. So, so this is the environment of trade. We should bear in mind that this environment is, was quite surprising. Everything from the Cadiz Habana to the Lisbon uh, uh, routes was totally new to the Europeans and came by surprise. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this map, quite famous map, uh, drawn in 1492, the year in which Columbus sailed to the Americas, Shortly before he did so, this was the worldview of the Europeans. You notice that something is missing around here. And this is uh, the Americas. The Europeans assume that if they sail long enough, they'll end up in India, as we know. That's why the term Indians refers to a, a Native Americans. So, so for the Europeans, the world have changed by surprise. They had to react to this change. The Europeans, uh, the Portuguese and the Spaniards were the first to react to these uh, uh, challenges. Uh, the English and the Dutch uh, followed suit not that long afterwards. So, so trade, as I think we all understand instinctively, uh, uh, as we all understand instinctively, a uh, long distance trade is challenging. It is challenging for reasons that could be uh, uh, formulated in economic theory terms. Uh, on the one hand, the payoffs, uh, the upward payoffs can be high, very high. But on the other hand, there are uncertainties. When uncertainties are converted to risks, the risks are very high. There are high investment thresholds once you have to create some infrastructure and to accumulate know-how. Uh, uh, there is a need for longevity of activity for reasons I'll specify. There was a need to spread risks more than before. Uh, agents could not be easily controlled. There was asymmetric information. There was a problem of contract enforcement. enforcement. There was a problem of expropriation by foreign rulers, maybe also by uh, uh, local rulers. So this was the environment, and this is the most challenging environment for business in, in early modern or pre-modern even uh, times, something that could be maybe compared to outer space or, or intergalactic voyages today. So today we are challenged, we are challenged by the question of how to organize uh, space voyages, whether to do it privately or publicly, whether NASA should do it, whether SpaceX should do it, whether it should be some sort of a joint venture. So imagine that these were the kinds of uh, challenges in early modern times when uh, organization of trade was an issue to be decided on. Uh, the, the cutting edge of organizational challenges of the time, by far the cutting edge, more than any kind of local domestic activity, manufacturing activity, short term, short distance trade that one could imagine. What was traded? I think that that's relatively known and go through it uh, briefly. Spices, tropical goods, some uh, uh, high end manufacturing, uh, uh, like raw silk, uh, porcelain, uh, some drugs later on, uh, uh, coffee and tea later on, uh, and silver. Silver, I think, is the most telling. That is, once the Europeans discovered the Americas and 
um, mined silver in the Americas, the Europeans started shipping silver from the Americas to Europe, from Europe to uh, uh, Asia and eventually to China. They did it mostly around the Cape and uh, at some cases across the, the Pacific from Acapulco to Manila and then on to Japan or to China. Uh, uh, the conversion, the rate of conversion of silk to silver improved for the European as long, uh, the further east they went. So they could make much more money by taking the silver as further east as they could. If they could take the silver all the way by themselves, all the way from the Americas, let's say from Peru to China, they could make the most, okay? they could profit the most. So this was the ambition. This was also the organizational challenge. What were the organizational forms uh, uh, used before the 1600, before the formation of the first Joint Stock Business Corporation? I would like to mention three of them. These three are featuring in the third part of the book, the family firm, the merchant network, and the ruler or the king or the emperor uh, 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 based or owned enterprise are the three forms. Uh, I study, uh, micro studies of each. I go through some of these micro studies momentarily. And I then try to show what were the constraints, what were the outer limits of each of these organizational forms. So, so these are the three, three forms. Uh, you can see the uh, in black on the slide that now you, you can see by now the slides. Uh, you can see in black the micro studies and in blue the constraints or the limits of each of these organizational forms. I, I'll do it in some more details now. So I, I, I studied the pool lineage it was based in Guangzhou, China. Uh, uh, I will not get to the details of this. I have about half an hour. I want to spend most of it on the Joint Stock Business Corporation. So this is one example for a family firm based in China, in maritime China, a family firm that had a, a quite an extensive net, a trade network in the South China Sea and beyond into the Indian Ocean. This, uh, this family firm was closely related to the Chinese uh, 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 dynastic government. And, and it did quite well for a while up until a dynastic change in China. Uh, for a few generations, you can see that the dynasty went on in its expansion, in its activity, until it identified with the wrong dynasty uh, and lost uh, uh, its fortunes and uh, social and political status. When we move to India, we can find similar examples in India. In India, we have the uh, Abdul, Abdul Jafar uh, family, which was based in Gujarat, India. The family uh, was active from the port of Surat in India. It had relationship with the Mughal uh, 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 rulers of the time. It had a significant uh, fleet of ships going all the way to the Red Sea on the one hand and to modern day Indonesia on the other hand. Uh, it was quite successful. It had a, a central hub and a couple of regional hubs. But eventually, after some generations, uh, intergenerational transfer problems and the rise of the Europeans kind of brought an end to this uh, family firm. The Fulger family firm from Augsburg, Southern Germany is our third and last example of a family firm. As I said, I don't get into the details. The details are in the book. Uh, the family firm was mostly a bankers, uh, 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 ran mostly a bankers business lending uh, money to other business persons, other merchants and rulers. At some point, the family itself got into trade. The family, among other things, uh, lended money to the Portuguese kings. So they were, the, the Fugger family was involved in the pro, uh, Portuguese project in Asia, but not through a joint ownership, but rather through a, a, a debt, through, uh, as creditors of the king, as lenders to the king. Uh, the, the family had a significant network in Europe, all the way from Eastern to Western Europe. It went through several generations. Each generational transfer was a challenge for the family. Uh, and eventually the family was also relying 
on the local rulers, on, le on the loans provided, and the, when local rulers went bankrupt, the family firm went bankrupt as well because uh, its loans, its, the huge loans it paid uh, uh, for the was conducted by the rulers, these huge loans were not repaid. So, so to sum up, what are the limitations of the family firm? I showed that the family firm can take us a long way, but there are some outer limits to what it could achieve. One a major problem is intergenerational transfer within the family. Uh, 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 the enterprise could either be dispersed into smaller units from generation to generation, or alternatively, some members of the family didn't want to go into business, thought that it's too risky, preferred to go into politics, into religion, to become landowners, uh, and they pulled out uh, uh, capital from the family. Uh, there was a problem of flocking in, there was a problem of intergenerational transfer and of management. And there was also a problem of uh, absence of asset partitioning. That is, there was no separation between the private and the business assets of the family firm. So family firms encountered these limits. And when the English and the Dutch came into a, a Eurasian trade, they had to, to think whether this is the model they want to adopt given the limitations of the model. The second, second of the three uh, uh, organizational forms, early modern organizational forms, is the merchant networks, a, kind of a step up from the single merchant or a step up from the merchant uh, uh, partnership. This is a network of families of merchants or of partnerships of merchants all coming from the same location or, or all coming from the same ethnic group. I'm elaborating in my book on a Jewish network based in Cairo on an Armenian uh, uh, network based in New Julfa uh, in uh, Persia. Uh, I won't get into the organizational details. There was a lot that could be achieved through networks. Uh, this is one example for a network. Another example for a network I just mentioned. A third example of a network based in Livorno, Italy, going all the way to Goa and to Java. But at the end of the day, the limits of the network were the limits of the ethnic group or of the, of the, of the uh, town members. One could not easily conduct cross-cultural or cross-regional across a religion uh, trade based on such networks. And there were many uh, uh, overlaps between the problems encountered by family firms and by uh, networks. Networks solved some of the problems of the family firms, but not all of them. The third model and last, is the ruler-based model. That is, the Portuguese, when they went to Asia, as I mentioned, ran an enterprise owned by the king of Portugal, the Carrera de India. It was controlled from the king's court in Lisboa. Uh, uh, the king sent Vasco da Gama, the king sent annual voyages of ships to Asia. Uh, the king has his, had his own house. He took care of the finance uh, as much as he could of, uh, uh, of this enterprise, for example, by borrowing money from the Fugger family firm. This is uh, uh, one example. The second example for ruler owned enterprise is the Chinese and his enterprises, uh, the early Ming enterprises kind of uh, orchestrated by, by the Chinese emperor and conducted by his uh, aunt, uh, uh, his uh, uh, assistant uh, Zheng He. And these voyages were funded by the, by the state, the Chinese state, based on tax, pay, tax payments. It was run by the Chinese state's administration. And it went all the way from China to the Red Sea, to uh, East Africa. Uh, it was of a very large scale, much larger than the Portuguese, much larger than anything we have seen before. But as much as the ruler-owned enterprise has had its advantages, like the military and naval support of the state, the ability of the state to, co of, to conscript uh, servicemen, uh, uh, naval ship crews and soldiers, the ability of the state to fund trade by tax, uh, by tax there were many disadvantages to state-owned enterprises. There was no separation between political and power gaining aims and profit or trade and maximizing aims. There were uh, and no separations in the accounts between profits, 
and expenses related to political ambitions. Uh, uh, the activity relied on the tax base, on tax capacity, state capacity on tax collecting apparatus. It was not voluntary, so it could re uh, 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 give rise to resistance. It was a kind of a command economy. Uh, it was highly connected to the foreign policy. Let's say once a Chinese dynasty changed its foreign policy, it uh, also determined the fate of its overseas trade. Uh, and many of the state inefficiencies, the large scale uh, uh, apparatus inefficiencies, when the people on the ground did not directly monetarily gain from the trade activities, all of these were downsides of, of state-owned enterprises. So to sum up part three of the book, there were at least three uh, 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 organizational types that were used, the family firm, the merchant network, and the state-owned enterprise. All of them took us a long way, but reached some limits. When the Dutch and the English entered uh, 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 the scene around 1600, as we move to the fourth and last part of the book, I think that they realized that neither of the three options is good for them. For various reasons, neither of them was good for them. Uh, 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 and now I'm trying to understand why the Joint Stock Business Corporation emerged in the Dutch Republic and in England, why around 1600, and why it acquired the kinds, the features that one can find in it uh, uh, in the East, Dutch and East English East India Company. Many of these features, many of these characteristics of the business corporation will be, be from, uh, 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 surviving all the way to the modern business corporation. So this was. Uh, 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 the first set of questions. The second set of questions is why only the Dutch and the English? Why not other parts of Europe? Why not other parts of Asia? For like 300 years, no one else was successfully adopting the model of the Joint Stock Business Corporation. So these are the questions, the research questions that motivated and generated my research in the fourth and last part of the book. So now uh, we have to familiarize ourselves with the with the corporation. The corporation as a legal entity, the corporation as a governance structure, not yet a business co purpose for business corporation, not for profit corporation, but rather corporation as it first developed in Europe. And the first corporations in Europe were religious corporations. They were related to the Roman Catholic Church, as I'll show in a moment. And then we'll follow the history of the, of the corporation from the Roman Catholic Church up until the, the East India companies in the next few minutes. So the Royal Catholic Church is, in my view, when I was trying to think comparatively on, on really Eurasian religions, the Roman Catholic Church is unique in that it, it, it combined two features uniquely. The first feature is the separation between the church and the territorial rulers, the secular rulers, the lay rulers. That is, in Europe, uh, there were on the one hand, emperors and kings and princes. On the other hand, there, were, there was this uh, 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 Roman Catholic church. There was the separation between the two, between the religious and the political, which is quite unique. In addition to this, the Roman Catholic Church was hierarchical. You can get this from the uh, pyramid shape that you can see here. The Roman Catholic Church was hierarchical. The top of the church hierarchy was the Pope, sitting for most of uh, uh, the, the history in Rome. Uh, from time to time, he was forced to travel around uh, outside of Rome, but mostly from Rome, and a very hierarchical administrative structure with cardinals, and with bishops, and with curia, with councils, going all the way down to the single community church, the single monastery, and the single a, a, a religious order. So this is highly hierarchical religion, which was separated from the state. You cannot find this kind of religion in Islam, in India, or in China. Now, the Roman Catholic Church needed to formulate a legal a, 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 a environment, a legal framework in which it could operate. So the corporation, the, the legal personality of the corporation was used as the tool for organizing the Roman Catholic Church. That's not something new that I'm saying 
as an innovation. It, it exists uh, uh, in the literature. Harold Berman was the first, I think, to, to present this uh, very clearly in his famous book. So, so the, the cooperation was created as the constitutional framework for the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, uh, the cooperation was used, for example, for appointing popes. There was, n if one doesn't want the emperor, the Roman, uh, Holy Roman Emperor to appoint a pope, one has to develop an alternative, some sort of a council that will uh, elect the new pope. Uh, uh, and this is kind of first uh, step in the governance of the, uh, uh, of the Roman Catholic Church as a cooperation. And let's say in a monastery, you don't want uh, uh, the monks to own property. You want the, the monastery to be owned collectively. The monks will not have a second generation because of a, 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 a Christian a, a Catholic a theology. There will not be a ability to intergenerational for intergenerational transfer to the second generation. So it had to be owned collectively and the cooperation is the solution for monasteries as well as to Pope and for everything in between. So this is the first step. And I think that this is important in understanding the uniqueness of Europe. The religion of Europe created the cooperation and the cooperation then unfolded beyond uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, two municipalities, the city of London was a cooperation, many other cities were cooperations, the Italian city-states were cooperations, universities, colleges, guilds, uh, were all corporations. So we have a process of a few hundred years of development, maybe 300 years of development of the cooperation in different public, semi-public uh, uh, contexts, initially autonomous from the state, in England at least uh, from, uh, uh, the, from the uh, days of the, uh, from the 16th century, let's say from Henry VIII and beyond, uh, the king took over a monopoly of creating corporations by using charters, the chartering of corporations. You can see here some quantitative data uh, on the chartering of corporations in England, universities, colleges, uh, uh, guilds, livery companies, municipal corporations, schools, hospitals, and, uh, at the end, and only down there we, and, uh, uh, we see some overseas trade corporations and banks. So, so the idea of chartering was older. You can see some examples of charters, starting with the universities of Cambridge and Oxford, going through a variety of uh, the city of London, other uh, uh, hospitals, schools. And down here, you can see the East India Company, the very last corporation here, uh, the very last in this slide is the East India Company to which we are turning now. So, so the corporation, as it moved, from political, religious and political purposes into business purposes, first used for organizing guild, formalizing uh, kind of uh, using, uh, uh, organizing guilds in a more formal ways through the corporate form, then regulated corporations, which are uh, incarnation of the guild, and eventually the joint stock business corporation. The difference, the important difference between the regulated corporation and the joint stock business corporation is that the joint stock business corporation had joint stock. That is, the corporation traded as such, whereas in the regulated corporation, each individual member has its own, had its own stock and traded it in, in his own stock. There was no joint stock. The corporation in the regulated corporation, like in the guild, provided an infrastructure, but not the active business activities. In the business corporation, the activities were taken uh, uh, were going on within the corporation through the joint stock. So this is the divide. This is kind of the organizational revolution that I'm talking about here. In this uh, 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 shift, the corporation embodied four new characteristics. This slide is very important for my uh, presentation, for my argument. My point is that there are seven attributes to the modern business corporation. Two of them were number one and two governance and legal personality were in existence before my revolution, so to speak. 
in the Roman Catholic Church, in municipalities, in universities, separate legal personality and collective decision making were already existing. Number three to six were created around 1600 with the East India companies, joint stock equity finance, the lock-in of investment, the transferability of shares, and, and the stronger protection of the capital accumulated, the capital pulled together and locked in the corporation, a protection of this capital from expropriation by the world. These four features are, are the, the, uh, at the core of the organizational revolution. Uh, attribute seven, asset partitioning or limited liability is a later uh, 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 invention. I wrote about it uh, recently in, an, in a, an article that is about to be published, it's online already. So the limited liability is an invention in my view of the 19th and 20th century, not before. Number three to six are the uh, organizational revolution. In order to uh, uh, create the, the, uh, uh, the preconditions for the organizational revolution, two problems had to be solved. Again, a very important point for me. First of all, the crown or the ruler had to credibly commit not to expropriate the asset of the business corporation. The English and the Dutch were able to solve this credible commitment problem. Others in Europe could not. The absolutist, all powerful king of France could not credibly commit, for example. So credible commitment of the ruler not to expropriate was the key for pulling together assets. Otherwise, investors were reluctant of pulling together assets, tangible assets that could be expropriated, could be taxed. They otherwise would have preferred to spread them around, hide them, work in very small units of uh, uh, business activity. The second problem is the problem of credible commitment of the insiders to the outsiders, to the outside investors, to the passive investors, not to expropriate them, not to cheat them, not to shirk on them, uh, to share with them reasonably, uh, in a reasonably fair way, the profits of the corporation. And, and in order to do this, even before this, to share with them information about the business activity of the corporation. So this is the way in which uh, the second uh, credible commitment problem was solved. I'll show it in a few more details in, in the coming minutes. So this is the charter of the East India, the English East India Company. The English company was formed in 1600 by this charter. The Dutch company was formed two years later by a different charter. <coughs> and, and, and my reading of the charter is that the charter is a contract between the Queen of England of the time, Elizabeth I, and the incorporators of the company, the merchants, that, uh, uh, the entrepreneurs that uh, uh, kind of initiated the, the company, its activities uh, and called for investment in the company. This is a contract and there was a credible commitment of the, uh, of the Queen not to breach this contract. And the tools used for this credible commitment were independent judiciary, for example, independent parliament, and a nascent rule of law, as I call it. I detail this in the book. And so these are, are, are the keys for understanding the, uh, the credibility of the commitment of Queen Elizabeth in the Charter, a relatively independent uh, 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 parliament, relatively independent judiciary, common law, uh, uh, some level of constitutional protections to the Charter in the common law, and over time also a, a vested interests that clustered around the East India Company and lobbied the Crown not to expropriate. And these were strong enough vested interests. So this is how the, East, the English East India Company looks like. It has a governor, it has a variety of officers, it has a joint, it has a, a, a court of committees, which is in fact the board of directors of the company, it has a joint stock. It has a general court of all of the shareholders. So this is the governance structure. This is the capital. Capital was initially raised for each voyage separately. You can see the numbers, uh, 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 about half a million pounds, a huge sum of the, at the time. Uh, uh, people subscribe to shares. This is not a very clear slide, but each of the investors, each of the shareholders subscribed for a sum. He was willing to invest. There was no fixed amount for a share at the time. 
And you can see a growing number of investors going from the 100 and some to 200 and some, nearly 300 investors in the English East India Company, by far the largest enterprise in England of the time, much larger than any other type of enterprise. And one could also see uh, uh, that the investors in the company were not only active merchants, but also uh, uh, people involved in European trade, manufacturers, landowners, gentry, in smaller numbers, but nevertheless, a, a wide variety of investors invested in this company. You can see it in these slides, which I will not go in, into details, but I think that when analyzing the shareholding of the East India Company, I realized that outsiders were willing to invest based on the credible commitment devices created, as I mentioned it earlier on. Uh, all of these invested in the company, landed aristocracy, uh, uh, gentry, uh, hundreds of investors altogether, most of them passive. Uh, uh, the company shares were gradually traded in, in the informal uh, uh, stock market of London at the time. It was not well organized market as the one in Amsterdam. But uh, on the whole, you get governance, you had investment in giant stock, you have voyages and, uh, and you have a long existing enterprise that was created in 600, 1600 and existed all the way to 1857, going through several incarnations over the time. The Dutch East India Company came out of somewhat different building blocks. The Dutch earlier history was different from the English earlier history the Dutch could rely on a, a commander, kind of limited partnership. The Dutch could rely on ship ownership, a, a, which was divided into shares. A, and it was, went through a couple of stages, initially pre companies and then a united company. The Dutch also had a charter. This is the governance structure of the Dutch company, somewhat different from the English one. You can see that the Dutch, a, East India Company, the VOC was a united company of six, six pre-existing companies. So there was a merger of six pre-existing, what's called pre-companies in the literature, each of them based on a different city. And all six were united in a kind of a, a, a merger and were run together by a, a, a single directorate at the top while having a, a, a directorate in the, a, 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 on the city level as well. And there was a coordination between the United Directorship uh, and the city level directorship. Uh, money was raised through shares in the various uh, uh, cities, a much larger capital than the one of the English company, more investors than in the English, more uh, the, uh, the Amsterdam stock market bourse was already active at the time. There was more trading in shares. The exit option was highly important in both cases, but even more so in the Dutch case, because the Dutch lock-in was involuntary. The shareholders in the Dutch company were locked into the company against their will. They thought that they are investing for a relatively short period of time, but then they were locked in for a longer period of time, but they could exercise an exit option by selling their shares in the open market outside of the company. And there was a market, there was some level of liquidity. This is how the Dutch company looks like different from the English company in the sense that in the Dutch company, there was an Asian hub in Batavia, modern day uh, uh, Indonesia. Unlike the British whose headquarters was only in London, the Dutch had two hubs, two headquarters, one in Asia and one in uh, uh, Amsterdam. As you can see in the co next couple of slides, there were many similarities between the, each, the English and the Dutch companies. They were both charters at about the same time for doing the same kind of business, having the same monopoly uh, uh, established for 15 or 21 years. Both had joint stock capital, centralized management. There were some differences between uh, the Dutch Republic in Eng and England. The Dutch Republic was federal. The structure of the in Dutch company reflected the federal structure, political structure of the Dutch uh, 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 Republic. There was stronger state support in the Dutch case to the company because merchants were more dominant in Dutch politics than were they were in English politics in the early 17th century. So there are differences between the two, but altogether, I think that the two represent, uh, the Dutch, by the way, had two classes of shareholders, English had only one, 
I will not get into these uh, details now, but they both embody the first manifestations of impersonal collaboration between outsiders and insiders, something that one could not see in any other type uh, of uh, uh, business activity uh, before uh, 1600. So, so I, I, maybe in the Q&A I can say some more about the differences between the two companies, but they both allow the pulling of capital, the longevity, a, a very significant information flows. I think that information is key for the functioning of the two companies, for the monitoring of agents on the one hand, and for the uh, credibility of the management in the eyes of the passive investors on the other hand. They spread risk, they monitor agent, they were able to calculate based on profitability uh, 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 alone without mixing profitability with other political or power gathering or dynastical considerations, without involving any tax money, without an, involving any coercion. It was a voluntary, uh, 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 both were voluntary organizations. And as I said, both acquired uh, uh, these four, uh, four new characteristics that were pivotal for the formation of these companies, were pivotal for the future history of the Joint Stock Business Corporation. All of them are still in existence today. They are pivotal in the rise to dominance of these two companies in Eurasian trade. And, and in terms of uh, economic outcomes, I think that the picture is clear. If you'll go here from in this case, from right to left, from 1500 to 1700, you see that the period from 1500 to 1600 was dominated by green, by Portuguese ships going around the Cape of Good Hope. This is a counting of which percentage of the ships going around the Cape of Good Hope belong to which country or which corporation. So the Portuguese dominated the 16th century, the English in red and the Dutch in blue dominated the 17th century and all of the English and Dutch companies were corporate uh, ships, were either English or Dutch East India Company uh, 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 companies. You can see that corporation took over Eurasian trade through the Cape Route uh, in the 17th century. Ruler owned ships were in the decline, corporate owned ships were on the rise. Uh, uh, we're talking about 400 ships sent in a single decade to, the, to Asia, huge numbers that could not be achieved in my view without the uh, organizational revolution, without the formulation of the joint stock business corporation by the English and the Dutch around 1600, 1602. And I uh, kind of, to kind of co contrast my explanation with that of others, I don't really see a, 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 a real uniqueness of the English or the Dutch or even the Portuguese in any of these other dimensions. The ships were not better uh, and as much, uh, and in fact, their ships, the, the European ships were much more suitable for the Atlantic than for the Indian Ocean. Indian and Chinese ships and Persian ships and Arab ships did much better in the Indian Ocean. Uh, 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 the Asians uh, managed more or less uh, navigational tasks, more or less as well as the Europeans at the compass, for example, and other navigational methods uh, were used by the Asians. Guns on board uh, uh, ships were used by Asians as well, by the Ottomans, for example, in uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, maybe there was a, some, for some, a short period of time some European advantage in terms of the use of guns from uh, uh, ship decks. Uh, and maybe the Europeans had some more willingness to use violence. I tend to think that the Europeans had more willingness the Portuguese with the Cartes system that required anyone to get license from the Portuguese are an example for the use of force, the Dutch and the English used force, but generally speaking, they did not enjoy sufficient uh, 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 naval uh, 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 superiority to exercise any willingness to use force. They were often defeated in Taiwan, in the Arabia Sea, uh, the Dutch and the English and the Portuguese. Uh, the real uh, technological, navigational, military, naval advantage of the Europeans uh, uh, was manifested in the 19th century and not in the 17th century. So my argument is that organizational advantage was the key for understanding 
uh, uh, European rise in the Indian Ocean, and particularly the Dutch and the English rise in the Indian Ocean. All other European countries were unsuccessful when they were trying to imitate the English and the Dutch. I think that I should soon uh, kind of finish. Do let me know whether I should, can go on for a couple of more minutes or should I stop now? Uh, yes, uh, a couple of uh, more minutes. Yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks. So what was unique, just to reiterate, for the English and the Dutch, first of all, the ability to pro uh, uh, convey credible commitment not to expropriate, credible commitment not to expropriate the merchants and the investors by the ruler, and credible commitment not to expropriate and cheat and shirk on the passive investors by the active investors. This was uniquely Dutch and English. Other Europeans could not imitate this because they had different political structures. I think that some of the Asians could imitate this. The, in, the Dutch first and also the English were also the first ones to develop stock markets in, uh, and stock market infrastructure that was highly important in terms of allowing the exit option in uh, corporate shares and the trading in the secondary market of corporate shares. When trying to explain why others did not follow, and I think that I'll conclude with this, uh, in the Middle East they had different solutions, let's say the Arabs, the Persians, the Ottomans, uh, uh, were able to go a long way with partnerships and networks. They uh, were able to go a long way with overland trade along the Silk Road. They were high, well located uh, uh, for the Silk Road. They created infrastructure like the caravan Serai, the Fonduk, the Khan along the Silk Road. So the uh, uh, Middle Easterns did well on, in overland uh, trade. They were, did quite well in maritime trade. The uh, Middle Easterners did not develop the corporation. They had the WAF, a different solution for many of their collective activities, but the WAF was not adjusted to business and to trade. In the Middle East, they did not have independent cities and universities like in Europe. Uh, uh, the Middle Easterns were better located they could trade within the large, vast uh, uh, land enterprises, uh, land empire, sorry. They had direct access to the Indian Ocean. They did not have to go around the Cape of Good Hope. And so the Middle Easterners did quite well up until the rise of the Europeans. They did not look for new institutional innovations for revolutions. They did not need them. The same applies for the Indians. They were even better located because they were in the center of Eurasia. They had easy access to the Indian Ocean, both east to China and west to the Middle East. They uh, 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 manage well business, doing business through family firms, as I mentioned in some of those examples. The Chinese uh, uh, had changing interest, altering interest in uh, 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 foreign maritime trade. When they wanted to conduct maritime trade in periods in which they wanted to conduct, they could do it uh, uh, through the Ming Dynasty and Zheng has voyages. They also had quite significant uh, uh, merchant networks in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Indonesia, including uh, the Sporic merchants there. So, so the Chinese uh, uh, managed their way well. The Chinese were developing over time an alternative to the European Business Corporation based on the family lineage, on the family clan. So the family lineage went through a variety of transformations over the centuries, and by the 16th and 17th century, became more business oriented, more voluntary, more corporate in terms of its uh, 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 asset owning. Uh, 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 and it could develop in a counterfactual world in which the Europeans wouldn't have shown up in India with the East India companies, the family lineage could serve as the basis for larger scale, longer distance trade uh, based in China and could potentially even be a, a model for other parts of um, uh, uh, Eurasia as much as the family uh, 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 could be, lineage could be imitated socially and maybe theologically and politically in other parts of Eurasia. So the Chinese did well when they want to switch, they were already blocked by the 17th and 18th century and definitely 19th century, they were blocked by the strong presence of the East India companies, the English and Dutch East India companies. So, so the, the non-European, non-Western Europeans 
either were not interested in, in long distance trade or were able to conduct long distance trade successfully without uh, institutional innovations. As much as they wanted to implement institutional innovations, they were missing the cooperation as a, 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 as a device, as a component, as a building block in the joint stock business cooperation because they did not have corporations in their earlier history like the Europeans had due to their uh, unique characteristics of the uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church. So to sum up my, uh, the takeaway from my, my talk, I think that one takeaway is that this uh, innovation, this institutional innovation was crucial for understanding the rise to dominance of the English and the Dutch in Eurasian and global trade. And secondly, that this uh, uh, institutional innovation is uh, 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 key for understanding the, the evolution of the business, joint stock business cooperation uh, into the 18th, 19th and 20th century. Uh, uh, it was a key in, uh, uh, in turning business organizations from one relying on personal uh, uh, familiarity through family, ethnic group, a, a, a city, a neighboring uh, dwelling and things like this into impersonal collaboration. So in both these respects of the development of business organization and the business corporation on the one hand and the rise of the Dutch and English and Euro Western Europeans to dominance in Eurasian trade, I think that uh, uh, the period I'm focusing on, the formative period of the early 17th century, the formation of the East India companies is crucial for understanding this. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Harris, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 in the interest of time, uh, let me be very brief uh, before I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Professor Zhu Chen Ma, to uh, organize uh, the uh, discussion and the Q and A uh, part of this uh, talk. I have two quick uh, comments or, or points I want to bring up. One is um, there is some interesting work by um, a Stanford economics uh, professor, uh, Ulrich uh, Mormandier. So she, she did uh, uh, some work to uh, dig up uh, the uh, Ro Roman practice uh, of a business organization that is very similar. Uh, to the um, modern business, uh, you know, limited liability corporation or joint, joint stock company. Uh, so Mermadier said uh, you know, at least uh, by uh, the third or second century BC, uh, the Romans were doing very similar things. Uh, but of course, after the Roman Empire ended uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, that disappeared that form of business organization disappeared. Uh, my, my second point uh, it's more about uh, the question uh, uh, regarding, uh, related to survivorship bias. Uh, yes, we know that now, you know, the, uh, the limited liability uh, joint stock corporation uh, is the survivor, has won, uh, especially after the uh, uh, 17th century, uh, especially after the Industrial Revolution, uh, for example. Okay, uh, but I, I understand your main proposition is that uh, long distance trade, were, because it was high risk and and so on. So that uh, gave rise to the um, emergence and adoption uh, of the joint stock corporation. But that could have been uh, some historical accident, in the sense that because the Dutch. Uh, were more willing to use violence and they had better weapons uh, than the uh, Portuguese, uh, you know, because by the early 17th century, the po Portuguese empire or the Spanish empire was very much uh, in decline because at that time, Portugal was uh, more or less uh, under the rule uh, of the um, uh, Spanish empire. So if, if, uh, the, if the Dutch had not been so strong in uh, uh, firearms and also in, the high, in their high willingness to uh, use violence than the Portuguese and Spaniards, uh, the limited liability joint stock corporation might not have won. Uh, so, so because 
before the 16th century, uh, there had been long distance trade uh, for many centuries. So how come uh, such a business organization did not arise earlier? Uh, maybe religion played some role. It took it all the way to after the uh, Reformation uh, for them to pick up this um, old practice by the uh, uh, ancient uh, Romans. Uh, but I, I, you know, I'm just trying to bring this up as uh, yeah. a devil's advocate uh, in this case. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Excellent, uh, excellent questions. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll, I I'll try to answer them briefly. I'm not sure whether satisfactorily, but at least provide some answers. So I'm familiar with Malman Deer's work. I also uh, am familiar with the more recent work by Giuseppe Dari Mattiazzi and uh, 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 his co-authors trying to show that the peculium of the Romans was the ancestor of uh, the joint stock company. So, so I think this is part of a larger question that I'm bothered with in other contexts as well of uh, uh, how come the Romans were so developed, let's say politically and legally and economically did not develop a, 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 some organizational uh, uh, forms that were developed later on, let's say in the early, media, e, e, early modern period. Uh, I, I'm dealing with this question now in a, a smaller project of mine, an article I'm working on, on insurance and other means for uh, spreading risk or, or allocating risk in the context of maritime trade. Why insurance was not invented by the Romans? Because one could explain why insurance was not invented, let's say, in the late Middle Ages, when uncertainty was high and information was not flowing and one could not price insurance premium. But apparently, under Mera Nostrum, the, uh, uh, the Roman uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea, one could price risks. So why not? So this is a permanent question. Uh, I'm not an expert in the Roman Empire. I encourage experts in in the Roman Empire, Roman economic historians, Roman legal historians to try to answer the question, to what extent were the Romans actually developing something which is resembling the joint stock company? But, uh, but even once we have this answer, the question is whether any of the knowledge of this actually uh, 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 survived into the early modern time. Because, I mean, I think that uh, 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 one of the interesting insights of Douglas North is that unlike technology, Institutional know-how tends to be forgotten more often, more frequently. So the fact that the Romans knew how to do it doesn't mean that the, the later Italians or Portuguese or Dutch knew how to do it. The, the knowledge may have been lost. So this is with respect to the Roman. Is this an accident what happened around 1600 in London and Amsterdam? Could be, definitely could be. So, so some of the earlier historians uh, uh, that I've mentioned of trade assume that it somehow happened due to some uh, uh, peculiar uh, coincidences. I'm trying to use history in order to make some more, to give some more sense to what was going on there, to understand what was in the minds of those who uh, uh, designed the ancient Dutch companies. They do not say so clearly in any records. Uh, we don't have all of the records, we have some of the records, but when you go through the records, they do not explain why did they organize the companies the way they did. I'm going to use history in order to give sense to this. Uh, 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 and I think that uh, uh, at least it's worthwhile to have my explanation on the table uh, uh, and to engage with it as an alternative to a mere accident. What, uh, what's the role of violence? I think that this is a question I'm always asked. Uh, and rightly so, because when you look at things from today, you can definitely get the impression that the Europeans used more violence. But my argument is that they did not enjoy the advantages. They could not exercise this willingness to use violence effectively because they did not have any military, naval, or, or technological advantages that could allow them to do this. Uh, and, and maybe to show, sharpen my insight on why is it organizational uh, solutions, organizational challenges rather than violence, I, I, I devoted quite a lot of time for understanding what the Portuguese were doing during the 16th century. And I realized that they did not find a good model. They kept changing their, their organizational model. I have a chapter in, in the book on this. The Portuguese did not find a proper solution. They were looking for various models of joint 
public-private ventures, none of these uh, models of ventures really work. They did not really have a good enough a tax basis or state capacity to do it by themselves. I think that the Dutch and the English as well could not run it as a fully owned tax funded uh, based enterprises. So I think that what, maybe the mother of all inventions is need. The, the English and the Dutch were disadvantaged. They were latecomers. The, the state capacity was not there. The technology was not there. They had to invent in order to be successful and I think that that's what they did. Yeah, so looking at, looking at Macau, then you see what the Portuguese uh, did or did not do there in comparison what, with what the uh, English uh, did in Hong Kong. Okay, so let me turn it off. Thank you. Let me turn it off yeah. to uh, Professor Ma. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, thank you, Professor Harris, uh, for the great talk. So in the following, I will moderate our discussion. Uh, first, we will invite our two colleagues, Professor Li Jin and uh, Professor Gao Pingyang, uh, before we can to answer some questions from the audience. So let's begin with Professor Li. May, may I ask, I, I, I don't have enough time to read all of those uh, uh, Q&As that are uh, 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 typed in. So if I can get some uh, print out of this at the end of uh, yeah, I, will, that would uh, be I will read, uh, select and read the question for you after the oh, discussions, yeah. comments, okay? So yeah. I'd be delighted to get the questions that were not raised here for because of the absence of time. So I'd be delighted to read them later on and try to respond to them outside okay. of this form as well. Okay, okay, sure. If so, that's doable technically, yes, sorry. Yeah, we will, we will give them uh, to you uh, later. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, Professor Lee. All right. Um, I say this is a fascinating book. You know, it's a fascinating topic, obviously, because it's a long distance trade. As uh, Ron has said, it took so long to, to, for the trade to take place. It's almost like now you are doing the trade to the Martians. You know, when you think about uh, trade of this distance, facing all the vastness, emptiness, you just get excited and you get inspired. This is fascinating. But I also think this um, book is uh, fascinating intellectually. It's fascinating intellectually for at least uh, two reasons. The first is that when you organize a trade like this, you can think about all of the problems that's common in organization in economics or institutional economics. You need to deal with problem with risk sharing. You need to deal with problem of agency monitoring. You need to deal with problem of enforcement, right? So you get a collection of issues that are central to transaction cost economics. And this is really kind of a carrier that has all of the components to it. But what I want to add here is that it's, I mean, I'm trained as an organizational economist, that I think it also deals with some of the classic question in organizational economics and strategy. Namely, the question is for why are there PPD in SSEs, which means that why are there persistent performance differences in seemingly similar enterprises? You know, why some companies are doing really well in trade while others or other countries cannot catch up? And relatedly, why don't the losers copy the winners? Right? These are, in some sense, are the central questions. Now, Ron gave one answer, which is kind of organizational form is a key competitive advantage. You know, I would say that I teach a class on organization and strategy, used to be at Kellogg, then at LSC, now in Hong Kong U. So I'm all sold on that. Mm -hmm. I do believe that uh, uh, organizational form is a key to competitive advantage of a firm. It's almost its core competence, right? If you take one of the innovation here, the capital locking, for example, the investment locking, right? If you think about what is the key for, for the trade back then, it is be able to raise a lot of capital. So you can build big ships, you can hire men, you can get um, gunpowder and all of this. The idea that you have a you have uh, a device that says that this voyage will not end, this cooperation will not end once you actually 
uh, have the capital you invest in the company, it will stay there forever, you know, because when you exit, you actually can sell it to another party. That's an important institutional advantage that allows the company to raise a lot of capital. That is key to, uh, I would say, the core competence of the company. But that's the easy part, I would say. It's kind of, you know, at least I'm sold. The more interesting question is, why don't other companies or other countries copy them, given that they have been so successful? Here I want to advance a notion um, of a distinction between micro-institution and macro-institution. Most of the time people just talk about institution or you have put a law, culture, everything in it. But in this uh, book, which I think is fascinating, particularly because of all the micro studies, you see that a lot of these innovations are micro. You still take it, say this investment locking or capital lock. It's a micro, my, it's an invest, it's kind of a, it's an innovation in the micro institution. But to have it approved, you go back to the history to look at what happened to Netherlands. They have to go to the estate general in 1612. Right? Originally, the, the, the VOC is supposed to expire on 1612, but then they want to make it permanent. You know, essentially, they are actually breaking the law in some way. So it is kind of the macro institution out there somehow facilitate the innovation in micro institutions. Mm -hmm. So we see that in the Dutch, uh, in the VOC case, uh, we saw a lot in the book, actually, some of the micro institution, you can think about the CELO as a micro institution. It's used essentially everywhere, but not in Islam based countries. Right, so this is another example that we see micro institutions, um, people know about it, but because of macro institution, we cannot do it. So one of the things, and I, I felt I learned a lot, but I feel like we can push further on this is to think about other than commitment issues, which is always what we talk about in one of the key macro institutions. Are there other features that can help us to understand more about how micro institution change and to some extent a feedback to macro institution? So this is important in the sense, if you look at what's going on in the world these days, we have digital currency. We have uh, Bitcoin and also. In Hong Kong, even you take an example of, do we have uh, one share, one vote also? What type of macro institution can facilitate this type of micro institution and vice uh, versa? So this is uh, something I feel we can learn a lot from the history and that's something uh, that can guide our current way of living, especially in the post coronavirus period. So, mm -hmm. so in this way, I find it fascinating and I just want to, to stop here. Yeah. Excellent, excellent comment and insights. I'll carry some of them with me to my, to my future research because I think that they're very helpful. I'll try to respond very briefly for the sake of time. So I think that I did not devote enough attention to strategy. This is a blind spot in my work. I, I'm not coming out of a business school. I'm trained in law. I'm in constant conversations with economists. Uh, uh, with historians, but business historians or business school management and strategy uh, scholars are ones I did not talk to enough. And I think that some of you probably can do this work much better than me, uh, examining the strategies of these corporations. In terms of uh, uh, copying, why aren't the losers copying? So, so, so I, I, I'm trying to use a supply and demand framework. So on the, on the supply side, some things cannot be supplied. Even when you know them, you cannot just copy them because of resistance. So I devote some time uh, uh, for developing a framework for institutional migration theory. And in that uh, 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 discussion, I'm highlighting resistance to migration. There are often vested interests, political interests, in, religious interests that would block the introduction of new concepts, particularly if they have a, a, a spillover effects into other realms of life, might threaten, let's say, the, the ruler or whatever. This is the supply side. On the demand side, sometimes you don't want to do the same activity. So I'm trying to focus on those episodes and periods and regions that want to do the same activity for reasons which are exogenous for me. I don't always know how to explain why do they want or not. I take it as a given. But then even if they want, as long as they can su 
supply the demand with all the frameworks that are satisfied. Sometimes by the time that you realize that you want to have an in, uh, organization in, uh, innovation, it's too late. Someone took the, a dominant position in the market and prevent you from doing this. Once the Euro Western European took over the Cape Route, at least the Cape Route was theirs for a couple of centuries. Uh, uh, so, so, so sometimes it will, might be too late to copy. In terms of micro and uh, macro institutions, I really like this framework. I think about it some more. I'm familiar with this uh, terminology with respect to technology. Uh, Joel Mokir, the series editor, and others have used it in terms of technology. So, so I, I was using the micro details in order to understand the challenges. As you said, if you focus on the first two decades in the history of the in, in their companies and see the kinds of uh, minute micro changes that they implemented, you realize what were the problems, what were the difficulties, what were they trying to solve. So by going through the details, you understand the bigger picture. So this is how I use it, but I think that you can use the micro macro distinction in other ways as well. And I, I, I reflect on it. Thanks. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Professor Lee. Any additional comments? I mean, I thought uh, um, there is a, going to be a lot of synergy between strategy and uh, organizational economics and particularly on economic history. And I think Ron mentioned earlier that uh, he would come to Hong Kong at some point. So I look forward to his visit so we can talk more about this. Okay, thanks. Well, now let's hear some new thoughts from our accounting colleague, Professor Ping Yang Gao, please. Oh, well, um, first, uh, Ron, thank you very much for this excellent talk. I've learned uh, a great deal of uh, things uh, that I, you know, I, I didn't, I, I, I was always curious, but I, I've never got a chance to get into. Now, um, being a business school professor, uh, I, I have two kind of um, uh, strong points that are stuck with me after reading the book. One um, has been touched on by Zhu as well as Jing you know, about this whole identification problem. What exact, how can we identify the cause of the rise of the, um, uh, the joint stock company? And in particular, in this context, I would have to say, after uh, listening to the entire talk, I in some way, I was a little bit discouraged. So you argue that on one hand, the new organizational form contributed to the dominance of the long-term trade by uh, British and uh, Dutch. But on the other hand, you also showed us that not only the contemporary European countries, but also the Asian countries uh, who tried to, to, to emulate, to mimic, but failed. And you attributed the different fates in terms of the what I call soft infrastructures, the uh, legal the legal infrastructure and the, the stock market in infrastructure. So in that sense, now I would say the success uh, of the or well, the rise of the joint stock company and its contribution to the uh, trade dominance by those countries is just a result of the other more fundamental institutional features. And therefore, um, in terms of decision makers in other countries, uh, or even the decision makers nowadays, we couldn't really learn much from their success. And so now, um, that part, I think, is a little bit, uh, we actually have a huge literature nowadays. I, I would say probably two literatures in the business school. Uh, one is the literature on the finance and the law, which started by Andrew Schleifer and a, a couple of uh, his co-authors about three decades ago. And there, the conclusion is actually quite similar to yours. I think uh, the punchline there is that somehow the common law system is much more efficient than the code law system or the continental law system in terms of uh, facilitating the development of financial markets. And, um, and similarly, they've shown uh, quite a few examples that we have a lot of 
stock markets nowadays, but very few actually have uh, been as successful as the Anglo-Saxon system. Um, so uh, last one point, and I, I kind of goes back to uh, uh, Zhu's point. I thought a lot about, well, how could we know, how could we pinpoint that those factors led to the rise of the, the joint stock option, uh, joint stock companies, which in turn contribute to dominance. Uh, so I, I'm not gonna dwell too much on that point. Um, the second point I, I find really interesting, uh, I would like to spend more time thinking about, is that you say, well, even for the English and Dutch systems, they were quite different. And now, um, the we have experienced three, uh, well, um, more than four centuries of uh, experimentations with different uh, variants of the basic organiza organizational structures. So then my question is that, well, what do we really mean by this, joint, this uh, new organizational form? You listed seven features somewhere in your talk, but how are, which features are the defining features or which features are the contributing factors to the success of this new organizational form? And the reason I, I am interested in that question is because I want to understand that uh, as a contemporary business school professor, what can I learn from your painstaking efforts of collecting the historical materials to guide the decisions we are facing nowadays. And as I mentioned earlier that we have the law and the finance literature, and we also have actually quite a, um, a few literatures. For example, we have the, um, uh, the, the firm theory literature, which tried to define the boundary of the firm. And personally, I'm very interested in kind of a sub-literature about what exactly is the value of the secondary stock markets where it seems that most people are speculating while some people are claiming that they are investing. And um, we have the enforcement literature that emphasized that the success of the modern capital market um, relies more on enforcement than on, uh, on the underlying uh, uh, institutions. And so uh, for me, I, I wanna kind of uh, borrow your brain to think about that based on the efforts you've made, uh, exactly how we could use the research to guide us in, uh, I could think of three types of questions. One is the very direct one, going forward, how can we improve or uh, reform the organizational form, the joint stock companies? For example, we have huge debates about corporate governance, um, the separation of the voting versus cash flow rights, the uh, board directors, independence versus knowledge, or uh, the corporate control markets problem. And based on your study, the historical experiments we had, well, it seems that, for example, in the context of the, the uh, EIC and the VOC, uh, somehow those, um, the the different um, corporate governance seems to matter little. Uh, now, uh, of course, that's only one data point, but can we think more about that? And another point, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very personally interested in is that what exactly is the trading in the secondary marketplace? Like, for example, uh, John Maynard Keynes man, uh, proposed that we should tax second market trading because uh, too much trading leads to the, 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 the beauty contest type of mentality and that could lead to myopium and all kinds of bad uh, uh, consequences. Uh, uh, my uh, professor back at Yale, uh, James Tobin, uh, proposed that famous Tobin tax uh, to, to tax the second market trading. Now in your context, again, you actually don't seem to put too much emphasis on the, uh, the, the trading of the, the, the stocks. 
And in fact, in your context, the, there isn't much difference between the, the, uh, the, uh, the, even the presence of an active transfer market is, isn't that a big issue. Now, of course, that's 400 years ago. But even then, I think, you know, we have the, 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 a lot of speculation in the secondary market. So um, I, I hope that you might help us to think a little bit about the more finer features of this organizational form uh, and their relation to the uh, performance of economic activity. And the second area I, I hope that the research could help us to think about is that can we have a little bit more predictive power in terms of what new organizational forms may arise? And we need to ask what are the drivers? Is, is it technological change? For example, we, the, the communication, the travel technology have changed dramatically. And now we're talking about the blockchain, which is a record keeping and verification technology. Would that actually change the uh, organizational form. Maybe the joint stock company uh, may not fit the purpose any longer. And another drive I was thinking about is the core asset change. That is, as Zhu mentioned earlier, the long distance trade is only, is it, is the nature of the trade matters or it simply represents some large scale uncertain commercial adventure? And even more, I think we might argue that maybe the core asset of a, of a commercial adventure has changed from capital to say labor, skilled labor or idea. And for example, Wikipedia is an amazing organizational form that has changed our, um, mm -hmm. well, maybe not commercial adventure, but at least a human collective adventure. And so um, I, I, in, in the interest of time, I, I'm gonna skip the third point, which I, I was thinking more about the other part that can the innovation in organizational form um, stimulate new type of economic adventure we might even not envision today, but that I, we can communicate uh, offline. So in some, I, I think uh, from a business school professor's perspective, I would like to, to acknowledge the difficulty of pinpoint the causality, but then at the same time, I would like to learn more finer details of, the, of this uh, historical uh, episode to help us to address those current questions. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd be delighted to get some of the more details of your questions in writing and uh, ponder them later on. I provide a few uh, initial answers now, for the, again, for the sake of time. So uh, the question of how do I prove or, or how do I identify causes, uh, maybe I, I, I'll approach the question from two different angles. One of them is that, uh, I mean, there are so many factors that could be relevant. And I, at some initial point, had to decide which of them I'll be taking as an exogenously given as a starting point without trying to explain, and which of them I'm trying to explain. So I was definitely selective in, in, in what am I trying to account for and what I'm taking as a given. Others could start differently and try to explain different uh, 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 factors in the story. Uh, what I'm offering here is only a first take, opening up of a research agenda, not a comprehensive and a con conclusive explanation, but rather I invite others to contribute and to debate with me and to criticize me. So, so one point is that I had to take some starting point as a given. The second is that I, I, I'm, as I said, I'm trying to work with some theory and I'm selective in, in, in selecting theory and, and with many of the minute uh, detail, organizational details and the way in which they evolve over time. So, so the, the working with the details assists me. And, second, and, and thirdly, uh, doing a comparative work. So, so uh, I'm using all of this uh, uh, in order to provide an explanation, definitely not the ultimate explanation. Uh, I'm sure that others could provide other explanation. Uh, another kind of uh, response. So, so I think that the basic dilemma of a, a personally based or impersonally based cooperation is definitely 
still present with us today. The fact that we call a, a, a things business corporations that doesn't necessarily mean that all business corporations are the same. In some economies, you can see business corporations that are organizing groups in family groups, which are really still based on, on personal cooperation. In other places, you see more impersonal cooperation. Uh, it's often the case that after a, a kind of a, a financial markets collapse, you think you see the disadvantages of the impersonal. During economic growth, you see the advantages of the impersonal, which allows you to expand uh, 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 the basis for investment and expand uh, firms, etc. So, so I'm not arguing that impersonal is superior or more efficient than personal. It's all a matter of context, of period, of society, and one could consider, have to consider both options always as uh, viable options. And there are definitely advantages to the personal in terms of agency costs and many other aspects. Um, in terms of predictions for the future, I find it harder as an historian to provide. Let's say if we think about what's the better mode for organizing space voyages, I don't have the answer. Thank you. What I think is that we they probably experiment with a variety of models, and at the end of the day, one of the models will prove uh, more successful than others. Maybe two models will be viable and could be sustained for a longer period of time. I think that experimentation with organizational solutions is the key for innovation. <clears throat> more experimentation, the bottom yeah. of uh, evolution process. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you both. Uh, actually, we're lost on time. It's over time a lot. Uh, so here, I can uh, I just uh, summarize uh, one question, one common question from the audience. It's a short question. Mm -hmm. uh, then we will finish uh, uh, today's talk. This question is about the, the, the legal origin behind the organizational innovation in the international trade in history. Uh, they ask that whether or not the, the difference of legal origins, for example, the civil law, common law, and Islamic law uh, mm -hmm. across different continents might account for uh, the divergence of the uh, corporate organizations. Yeah. Yeah, whether or not this so, is the case. Yeah, so, so I, 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 I mean, I, I think that both in this project and other projects of mine with some co-authors, uh, among other places in Yale, like Naomi Lamoureux, Tim Gennan, and jean Laurent Rosenthal, we are quite critical of the legal origins theory about, about the superiority of the LSV theory, about the superiority of the common law. The story I'm telling here is not about the common law. It's a story about a... a political systems, both on the continent and in England, uh, they are differently organized. One is organized as a federation, the other enjoys some a, a separation of powers on the constitutional level. So the common law is not a key for my explanation. I think that there are different ways of arriving at, at joint stock companies. They are not going through the, the common law kind of, a, they can, they emerge from other parts of the political system, the religious system, social, social structures, I think. Uh, 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 it's not a common law. The common law plays a relatively, and in that respect, you could, uh, in, in a way, Islam was dynamic in a variety of ways. One could conceive Islamic law as a bedrock for such developments in different historical circumstances. Uh, one could envision Roman civil law tradition as giving rise to this. So, so I don't really buy in this context the advantage of the common law story. Okay, thank you, Professor Harris. So Professor Chen, you gave a concluding remark. Uh, yes, uh, again, thank you, uh, Ron, uh, for this uh, great opportunity to learn from your work. Um, I, I know we are already uh, out of time. Uh, let me just quickly mention uh, that uh, uh, in two weeks, or actually three weeks time, we're gonna have uh, Professor uh, Peng Kai Xiang uh, to give a talk uh, on the, um, the 13th of August, uh, but that uh, talk will be in uh, Mandarin, in Chinese, uh, it's on uh, it's uh, about his uh, uh, research on the legal uh, system, uh, the evolutionary history of China's, especially 
the Qin Dynasty's uh, legal system. Okay, so if you have not signed up uh, to join our mailing list for the webinar series, so here is the uh, barcode you can scan and then sign up there. So, um, okay, so see, hopefully uh, we can see all of you uh, in two weeks time. All right, so again, uh, thank you, Professor Harris uh, for you. Uh, doing this uh, talk. Uh, and also my thanks go uh, to uh, my colleagues uh, to discuss uh, the book. And uh, again, uh, thanks to all of the uh, uh, attendees uh, in today's uh, talk. All right, so that's it for today. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much you. for the Bye. invitation. Enjoy the discussion. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.